Savior, please stay with me. Don't leave. Abide with me here in this house. And abide with me within the confines and the walls of my house. I can't control what goes on out there. But I sure can control what goes on in my living room. And I don't want to offend him. Why? Because whether I know it or not, my nonchalant, careless attitude of, oh, well, the Lord understands, is going to cause him to be a wounded lover, a neglected lover, one that I think he'll just understand. And no, he don't understand. We can't treat him with such neglect as that and expect him to say, oh, you ready for a blessing? Be right there. Got a double handful pour on you. He looks at us like he did Jerusalem at times and weeps. Oh, Jerusalem, if you only knew, if you'd only come to me. and Well, I have come to the Lord. Yeah, for five minutes, and then we head right back to watching junk. I have. I've done that. Psalm 85. I'm trying to convey my thoughts here to you. Now, this psalm was written evidently from a time when, look at verse 1, when they had been in some type of captivity here because all these psalms were not written by David at the time uh, David was alive. Some of them were written later. Look at verse 1. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. You showed favor. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. You brought us back out of Babylon, Lord. You brought us back to an understanding of the original message as taught by the apostles. You've showed us doctrines that the world don't want much to do with. You've showed us predestination, election, security of the believer, the gifts of the Spirit, baptism in the Holy Ghost, the power of Jesus' name, the blood of Christ, sanctification by the Spirit. All these things, you've took the original messages taught by the, the, the apostles and you brought us back. You've done a marvelous, glorious thing, Lord. See, I'm using this in the spiritual, if it's okay. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. You, you've even forgiven our, our sondering and blundering and wandering astray, the embracing. The world embraced and affected people by embracing all kinds of creeds and dogmas. But, oh God, out of the midst of it, you brought your people through the thickness. How in the world, if it wasn't for election, could God reach through all of that junk that was dumped on the church and find his elect and bring them through that and out of it. He said, you've forgiven us. You've forgiven us for our wrong. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. You're, you're not angry at us. You've turned us your wrath and has turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation and cause thine anger toward us to cease. <coughs> then he asks a question. You've done all that for us, but will you be angry with us forever? Will thou draw out thine anger to all generations? And then he asks in verse 6, You've done all of this, Lord. You brought us back. But i got a question for you. Wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee? Won't you? We're discouraged. I find myself battling discouragement often. Why? Because it used to be, I, I remember, and Brother Tom remembers Kelly Talbert. I remember Kelly talking to me and John one day. And he said, boys, I remember a time when you could go right out here on the street and throw your Bible up in the air and go to preach and stomp your feet. A crowd would gather around you. And out of that, you could get 20, 30 people, and you could tell them, I'm going to be having services over here. And before long, you'd have a church. Give that a whirl now. See how that works out. It's discouraging when it, you, you know, and, and you, there's times in my personal life, I try to share the gospel in places I'm at. Try to bring it up wherever I'm at. And sometimes I get the impression it's one of two things. Either I don't need what you're saying because me and Jesus are tight. We're buddies. Everybody you talk to is saved out here because they've embraced their idea of what getting saved is 
They've embraced whatever they want, however you like it, and been told that by the church world. There are charismatic, supposed to be spirit-filled, tongue-talking churches that I've seen and watched on, on the video clips that have told news commentators, they said, do you believe Jesus is the only way to salvation? Well, no, not exactly. He's, uh, he, he's pretty strong. He's in there, you know. He, he's a, a major one to talk. But there's, there's other, uh, you know, deceiving masses, people embracing all of that. Well, I try to share, but at times when I do, I get the impression that people are convinced they don't need God or they don't want Him or I'm already, I've got this thing all worked out. Or I'm just, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I don't give religion much thought. Lady, when I took Lisa up to the dentist lab, I talked to her, young lady, if you ever think about, you know, well, I don't give religion much thought. You know, mm, I see. Well, I talked to her, and she was nice about it and grinned and chuckled a little, but she let me know I'm really not interested in hearing what you, that's not one person. That's what I find by and large. It grows discouraging and you begin to develop an attitude of what's the use. And it affects my enthusiasm and the fire of God. And I prayed one thing at home. I said, God, the older I get, please hear this prayer. Don't let the fire go out. If my body wants to break down and fail me, that's one thing. But don't let the fire of God go out in my soul. He asked, and he said, is there any chance of you reviving us again? Will you not revive? And that way we can rejoice. Well, let me give you the good news. He asked a question. I'm going to give you an answer. You may not see a big revival where the masses come unless something struck this country. You would see people turn to God temporarily a lot of times. When the planes flew into the, the buildings up there, oh, I'm telling you, they had people praying and weeping and everything. They had a, a few uh, weeks of holiness there, and then it was right back to business as usual. But I want you to know as individuals, as small groups, you don't have to sit in uncertainty and think that because that's the spiritual temperature of the day, that that falls your lot to allow that to cool you down. They're cold, so you got to be cold. They're not interested in spiritual things, so you can't show a lot of interest. That is a lie the devil would have you to believe. Because none of it has weakened God or shortened his arm or made it hard for him to bless you. He still done something at Calvary that opened up the way for God. And God is justified to bless me with every blessing that there is in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, I want to give you what I call a word from the word. And we'll be closing here in just a moment. I'm going to give you a word from the word. And I'm going to give you one here in a little bit that you can bank on for sure. But this, one, I think, is a word I underlined, colored it in because it applied to me. In Isaiah 44, Everybody got Isaiah 44? Look at verse 3. God said, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. If you're thirsty, what was the song we sung a while ago? Fill my cup, Fill my cup Lord. Well, Brother Bruce, uh, the world don't much. Well, I could care less what the world wants. I want my cup full. Well, they won't nobody listen. That's their problem, not mine. I want my guest, my friend who's come to be a guest at my house, the silent, invisible guest that sits at my table when I eat or sits in my living room when I'm reclining. I want him to feel comfortable there. I want him to say, now this is the kind of place I could stay in. 
I would like it where when people walk off of the streets or some of my kids are come, they immediately, without me saying anything, can feel the spiritual climate different in my house than what they just left. Is that possible? I'll pour water on him that's thirsty. The problem is we ain't thirsty enough. It shows in our activities. And floods upon the dry ground. I mean, I'm talking about, anybody familiar with the term gully washer? God's saying, I'll pour, I'll fill your cup, and I will send a gully washer. Well, why don't you do it? I'm waiting on you to, to, to show me that you really love me. I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. <laughs> That's all I'm going to read right there. I've told my wife, you see, folks, I'm determined. Now, I can't judge you guys. I don't know or whoever would hear this video or anybody out there in the world or whatever. But I know on my part, I need to be doing more. Not to earn salvation. You can't earn salvation. You know that. But I'm going to tell you there's some things you've got to buy from God. What? Jesus said to the church of the Laodiceans, I counsel of you to what? Buy. Buy from me gold tried in the fire. You see, intimacy with God will cost you something. Yes. It will cost you some lost sleep maybe. It will cost you, instead of being real interested, wanting to see how that show ends, Shut the thing off and pray before you get so sleepy you can't. Hello. Yes. Right. Actions on my part because, guys, as the day grows and things go along, I'm convinced more and more. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. We used to use that to the sinner man, and that's good and fine. But actually, he's addressing his church. We've heard that taught on the outside of his own church, and they're none the wiser about it. Church is by, and I'm not here to slur, and it's just a fact for anybody that's got eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying. That Jesus Christ is nowhere around much of this stuff. I know because it's full of paganism and everything else. And then they justify the wickedness that exists there. And then there are those, oh no, we're having the firefall. And all it is is a man with an ego building a kingdom for himself. Not being harsh, it's just what I see. Jesus Christ is not glorified. He's got to be at the center of it all. He's got to be the one that's exalted and talked about. And he says, I'll build my church. You worry about doing what I called you to do, and I'll do the church building. Now, I want to give you another passage of Scripture, and this is the final one in Luke chapter 11. This is what I'm saying. It may cost you something. But the prize is worth whatever you may pay to obtain it. It doesn't come all at once. But wouldn't it be fine if our kids come into our house and all of a sudden they knew, noticed that the spiritual climate there was much different. Because folks, I honestly think you can build an atmosphere in your home that is conducive to Christian living and to conviction and all by you being in a place of prayer and praise and filling that house with something besides garbage and nonsense from Hollywood or backbiting or any whatever else that goes on in places. By conversation about holy things. I sit down and want to talk about God. And most folks are interested to talk for him for a few meager moments. And that's all. And I'm thinking, I, I could, this was, that was one thing I liked about going to see an old brother. Wessel we was talking about. The old harsh fellow. 
That man, he and I spent seven hours one day. And all it done was whet my appetite. He could tell you about all that stuff and people from Azusa Street that he knew and all. I remember their names, he told me. And stuff that went on. And, and then he'd, begin, he'd stop every now and then and sing, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And I'd say, my stars, go ahead, chew me out. Call me bad name. Be critical and harsh. But keep talking this stuff. Wouldn't it be wonderful? I honestly think that prayer and praise, I wrote it down in the back of my Bible what that guy said uh, in that book who was one of the, the men from that era that started out in Topeka, Kansas. And I can't find it now. Well, that's how we do. We write something down. No, he said prayers and praise is the road to the presence of God. I think you can bring on an aura or an atmosphere in your home. Now, look at chapter 11. We read this and let you go. Verse 5 says, Which of you shall have a friend that shall go to him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in his journey and has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer him and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed, and I cannot rise to give thee. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give as many as he needs. You know what importunity is? It means it was he didn't engage in an action that lasted one time. Go away. Okay. No, there was a not stopping. It needs to become a way of life that God is ever before us, that his praise is continually on our lips, that our prayers are offered up. And that we would never want to do anything. You know, you could holler out and say, Brother Tom, I just studied something in the Bible. God done something. Well, good. Here, let me hang. I got to go, brother. Hang, click. I, sit down and share that with me. We were so eager to hear. I just used that as an example. I hope you don't mind. But we could use that. Wouldn't it be something if we were so eager and anxious that we found every excuse in the world to lay other things aside and knock on the door and say, hey, It's me. I'm thirsty again. I just poured a whole bottle of drink in your cup while ago. I drank it dry and I want more. Wouldn't it be something? And he goes on saying, I say to you, ask. And, and some translations I've heard literally, it says that means keep on asking. Don't just make it a, hey, Lord, I'm hungry. Well, he'll send it when he wants. No. I said I was hungry. I can't take no for an answer. I'm like Jacob. I ain't going to turn you loose till you bless me. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall be opened for. If this is a promise, an unfailing promise made by our blessed Redeemer. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now this is where the promise gets good. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone or ask a fish? Will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Now hear this blessed, glorious promise that is a, can be applied to our lives at all times. <coughs> Even in the last days when wickedness abounds. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? How much more am I willing to give the very life of God to you? Oh, well, I've got the Holy Spirit. I'm kind of needing a few other things. from. That's not enough. We want Jesus plus something else. That will make us content. Come on, Lord. Answer, do this for me. Do that for me. Because I'm not satisfied with you alone. 
Jesus Christ can walk into my house, but that's not enough. I want him to do something for me. Well, I've come to the place in my own self. Don't do anything if you don't want to. But oh, evermore, give me this water. Oh, don't leave. Don't go nowhere. Stay with me. I'm not worthy of the least of your blessings. Let me wash your feet. And he says, well, I beg your pardon. I'll wash yours. Folks, it may get bleak out there. But we don't have to be satisfied with growing spiritually lean when you've got a place to worship here. And a man that throwed all creed books away, I think. I ain't seen none of them hanging around here on the wall. Go to some places, what we believe, and they got it stacked up there. I like to say, take that down and put this up there, what we believe. And guys... I've pastored, and this is in love, but I've pastored church. I've preached in places. Oh, I tell you, brother, what we believe in here, we believe in that right there, that Bible right there. You stay right there in them pages. I'm with you, brother. I don't care if they want to throw you out. They'll throw me out. I'm with you. And you get up and preach something right out of it, and they're the first ones that want you gone. I've seen that. It's just a lot of lip service. No action. All talk. And that's a condition that prevails. But you and I do not have to be affected by that. The lamp of God can burn bright if they but two of us. The fire of God can burn bright. I can go and sit in my house. The other morning, I was sitting there thinking, I said, God, I'm going to open your book up here. And I just don't want to read a passage of Scripture. I want you to talk to me. Oh, I, I'm, my ears are, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm ready. I'm dying. I'm like a starving man. Talk to me. And you know, I just happened to have it open, and I looked down, and I had it underlined, in my, highlighted in my Bible. <coughs> he said, now this, this, this may not bless a lot of folks, but he said, I, even I am he. That blotteth out thy transgressions. Oh my. <laughs> Brother. Folks say. Well, well, yeah. They're not moved by that. They don't know him. They've not been touched. Or that would cause that fire to begin to glow. And now get the next thing he said. I, I am even he that blotteth out thy transgressions. For mine own sake. I thought you did it for me. I done it for me. I don't want to remember all that garbage you've done. It grieves me. It hurts me. I want to have fellowship with you. I love you. And you know what? That stuff got to be dealt with. And I made a way through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that it could be washed and you can stand justified as though you never done. Nobody can bring an accusation against you. I'm he. For my own sake I blotted out you. And he said, and I will remember them no more. You know what? I had revival. You don't have to call in a visiting evangelist to have revival. You don't have to have special meetings and try to get the participation of the public to have revival. This is not some fake formula I'm giving you or something to make you feel a little better. It's living reality and truth. You don't have to call in some big shot from somewhere and get a lot of people out to have a revival. In fact, I've done that and there wasn't no kind of revival or blessing in none of it when it was over with. Woo, glory. Bless him. Bless him. I want you to do me a favor. While we sing acapoco, acapello, and that ought to be good news. I don't have to get a great special anointed man to come here to have revival. Because the great special anointed man is here in our midst. He's come to pay us a visit, a divine visit. We should be ever so grateful that he's here. We brought him in our hearts. He's come to live. What was the song Brother Tom sung a few weeks ago? Now I belong to Jesus and Jesus belongs to me. Not 
for the years of time alone, but for eternity. And we bring him in here and we gather and assemble and he says, I'll be here. I'll walk among those seven candlesticks. I'm there. Oh, that's about the best evangelist I know you could call in for a meeting. And you know something? He won't give you something fake. He won't give you something artificial. He'll give you a genuine, true touch that's from him. Turn to page 307. We'll sing this without music. I'm going to sing a little of it.